Uh, thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. And for your flexibility uh, and patience in uh, trying to always make room for others. So there's many people uh, that would like to take part in this, even if uh, they have to stand, uh, can, can do so. You have come to Beyond the Vinci Code. It's a composition before between Professor Mark Irwin of the University of North Carolina and Professor Richard Hayes of the Divinity School. The focus of this evening's conversation is not the book, the Da Vinci Code itself, but rather the issues that the Da Vinci Code raises for interpreting the New Testament and its relationship to the larger Christian church. Dr. Irvin is the James Gray Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Department of Religious Studies at UNC Chapel Hill, where he has taught for the last 18 years. His primary areas of research are in New Testament Interpretation, the History of Major Christianity. Dr. Irvin is the author of 16 books, including recently released Truth and Fiction in the Vinci Codes and His Glory of Jesus. We both are very popular uh, in our culture today and beyond. Professor Berman is a graduate of Greek College with an MDiv and a PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary. Dr. Richard Hayes is the George Washington I. University Professor of New Testament here at the Divinity School, where he has taught since 1991. He is widely known for his research on the letters of Paul and his work on New Testament ethics. Professor Hayes has edited two books and authored seven including the moral vision of the New Testament, which was selected by Christianity Today as among the 100 most influential religious books of the 20th century. Dr. Hayes has a BA and an MBA from Yale and a PhD from Emory. He is an ordained United Methodist minister. Far more important than those things, though, as a student of both of them, uh, I can tell you that both of these scholars are wildly popular as teachers and have that rare ability to articulate rigorous and detailed scholarship in a language that is accessible and inspiring to lay people and students alike. I might add that when I said that uh, uh, Dr. Roman's work is uh, popular in culture today, it's not that it's not scholarly, it's deeply scholarly, uh, but it also has made its way into the New York Times uh, bestseller. And so it's being widely read uh, by people beyond uh, the academy. It is a gift to have both of you here. Professor Hayes, Professor Kerman, thank you. I want to uh, say thank you to one other person before we began. Uh, the event was planned by a whole uh, group of people, but one person in particular put in an extraordinary amount of effort. Uh, and that is Tom Offer, a first year divinity school student who's also part of the Big Socratic Club. He really was the key organizer of all this. Uh, Tom, where is Tom? Uh, he's <laughs> so again, our hope of the evening is to have a thoughtful dialogue around the issues uh, for New Testament interpretation of the history of the church uh, that are raised by the Vinci Code. Uh, what I'm trying to have the Baker say, though, if there is disagreement, that would be fine. <laughs> uh, the format briefly will go like this. Each scholar will have an opening three minutes to respond uh, to the issues that he sees fit to speak to raised by the Vinci Code. Uh, and I will pose a couple of questions. Uh, each one of them will have a couple of minutes, a few minutes to respond. And then the two of them will ask each other questions for a few minutes. Then I will pose another question. Then they will ask each other questions for a few minutes. And then at the end of all that, which will take approximately 45 minutes, uh, they will have, we will have an opportunity for a question and answer from all of you. And we hope to leave 30 or so minutes uh, for that. Uh, if you have a cell phone, please set them on stun. <laughs> the rest of the evening. Thank you, all of you. So let's begin. Uh, first, Dr. Hayes uh, has three minutes uh, to respond to the questions uh, raised by the Vinci Code as he sees. Well, thank you, Greg. We're going to try to speak quite concisely about matters of the Vinci Code. 
Because I think on with regard to our assessment of the book, Bart and I don't disagree very much. The main area where we might disagree is if he liked it better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a novel. Um, I think it's a piece of dreadful, tedious, sophomoric writing. <laughs> <laughs> But where we don't disagree is, is that the book is simply rife with laughable historical errors. Those of you who are students may not like to hear this, but there's a certain sort of uh, clandestine correspondence that goes on among those of us who are professors in the field, in which some of my colleagues occasionally gather up tidbits of howlers and mistakes that have appeared on students' final exams and circulate them on email. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, had the Vichy Code uh, and his claims about the formation of the New Testament canon been written on a final exam, I think it would be fair to say that it would turn up in such an email circulation of historical howlers. Notions such as the claim that the Dead Sea Scrolls contain Gospels with secret information about the Holy Grail, and, uh, and that Constantine is responsible for uh, assembling the New Testament canon, and so on and so on. These, these are simply historical falsehoods that have no basis whatever, in fact. Some of you may have seen the film National Treasury featuring Nicholas Cage uh, a few uh, months ago, you know, a year or so ago. It, it, it's a film that works on the premise that on the back of the Constitution of the United States there are actually uh, secret instructions that lead the heroes of the story to find a hidden treasure buried. Is it under Washington or under Philadelphia? Which is it? Uh, in, in any case, they, uh, if, if you believe that there's a secret treasure map on the back of the Constitution, uh, then you should also perhaps take the Da Vinci Code seriously in history. <laughs> more, more concerning to me on a more serious level is that the Da Vinci Code is characterized by what I think is a really evil, virulent anti-Catholicism. I'm not a Roman Catholic, as you heard in the introduction, I'm an ordained United Methodist, but I think there's a, a vicious prejudicial portrayal of the Roman Catholic Church uh, as willing to be engaged in murder in order to uh, protect claims that it knows to be false. But mostly what I want to say, and I promise you that I use my time already correctly, mostly what I Mostly what I want to say, and I can do this briefly, is that the Da Vinci Code, apart from its historical errors, which Professor Aaron will undoubtedly say something about, I think the Da Vinci Code is deeply confused theologically, and for two reasons. First, the Da Vinci Code claims that the early church was engaged in a conspiracy to cover up claims about the humanity of Jesus and try to destroy gospels that portray him. Jesus as human. If the early church did that, they sure did a crummy job of it. Because our Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and Hannah all drive towards the central plot element of the crucifixion of Jesus dying, weak, powerless, helpless, as a victim on the cross. In other words, the Gospels do give us a Jesus who is a human being and subject to human weakness. Secondly, the Da Vinci Code pivots very strongly on the claim about the divine feminine. The notion that somehow the church has tried to suppress the uh, divinity of the female. Now, the reason I say this is confused is that the Christian tradition has insisted that God is not gendered. That man and woman are both created in the image of God, and that the image of God entails both male and female. <laughs> if it is the case, as the Da Vinci Code claims, that Jesus was merely a human prophet who was later declared, centuries later, by the church to be a divine figure, then in what sense is it a matter of religious significance if he was married to Mary Magdalene and had a child? Why does that make the feminine divine if Jesus was divine. There's a, just a, a deep logical confusion built into the 
plot structure of the novel on that particular theological point. I could say more, but I'm not going to. I've used, I think, more the time than I should have. Those are my concerns about uh, the book, and we perhaps can come back to it in question and answer. Sorry. Okay, so true confession. Okay, I did like this. <laughs> Literary style, read Jane Austen. Uh, but uh, this is not uh, this is not a book for literary style. It's badly written. But if what you want is a page-turning novel that is a uh, an interesting, uh, it's a murder mystery that is a little more clever than most books of that genre. It has twists and turns that you might not expect. Uh, that uh, that gives you religious knowledge that previously you didn't know, uh, mainly because it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> And if you're interested in, uh, in uh, Vatican cover-ups and conspiracy theory, then this is the book for you. Uh, so I, I have no trouble uh, with it as a novel per se. I also think that the Da Vinci Code has performed a large service uh, because it has gotten people to ask questions that are important and to pursue historical knowledge that matters. People uh, who otherwise never would have done so are asking about who the historical Jesus was. Who was Mary Magdalene? What about the other Gospels that didn't make it into the New Testament? How did the New Testament canon get formed? What was Constantine's role in early Christianity? Five years ago, if the talk had been advertised uh, that there would be uh, a discussion about uh, the other Gospels, Constantine and the canon, there would be 20 people here. <laughs> the fact is, people are interested because the Vinci Code has raised these questions. The problem is that it raises the big question, and I think in many respects, actually, uh, Dan Brown gets the big, the very big answers right in many ways. The problem is that in virtually all of the details, he's got them wrong. There were the Howlers that Richard mentioned, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls containing the Gospel of Jesus, or the Gospel of Philip being written in Aramaic. Uh, it was written in Coptic. Uh, there are um, mistakes. Uh, throughout the Vinci Code. I don't know why they call these howlers, they're just plain mistakes. Uh, for example, that all of the other Gospels constantly refer to the marriage of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Uh, false. In fact, no Gospel mentions the marriage of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. No Gospel whatsoever in the Christianity period mentions it. The idea that Jesus was not the Son of God until the Council of Nicaea in the year 325, when there was a vote taken among the bishops and a, a close vote at that. Uh, in which Jesus was declared the Son of God, uh, absolutely bogus. That Constantine was the one who decided which books would be included in the New Testament. It was Constantine who chose Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Absolutely false. There are other things, of course, that are just problematic. Uh, that uh, I wouldn't say are mistakes, it's just they're, uh, they are uh, problematic interpretations. For example, that Jesus and Mary Magdalene probably were married. Well, I wouldn't call that a mistake. I mean, I think it's absolutely wrong. But it's it's not the same category as saying that the Dead Sea Scrolls contain the Gospels. Uh, but but it is uh, it is a highly problematic uh, claim, I think, and, and, and probably false. Or that early Christianity was principally concerned with the divine and feminine. In fact, early Christians were concerned about other things. When I uh, talk, talk to my students about the Vinci Code, um, I, uh, I tell them that uh, if they want to learn about the history of the Middle Ages, the way to learn about medieval history is not to watch Don Python and the Search of the Holy Grail. <laughs> if you want to learn about the history of early Christianity, don't read the Da Vinci Code. Uh, take a class on early Christianity and read what some historians have to say and get your facts right. Well, uh, for the last comment, read what historians have to say and get your facts right. Both of these gentlemen are historians. So, the first question I'm going to ask them uh, is um, and they each have seven minutes to, to respond to it. Uh, is about the portrayal of Jesus in the New Testament. Does the New Testament give us a reliable portrayal of Jesus? And some of the things they might want to hit on in that are the Gospels historically factual, are there contradictions between the Gospels, 
And as the text of the New Testament has been corrupted over time by its transmission in the church, does the New Testament give us a reliable portrayal of Jesus? Professor Hayes, you have seven minutes. When we were talking about this topic over dinner tonight, Craig said to me, you know, some of these time intervals may be too long. You have a whole seven minutes to talk about what the New Testament gives us to Those of you who are in my introductory New Testament class know that I just finished a whole semester attempting to answer that question. And on the question of whether the text of the New Testament has been corrupted over time by its transmission, Professor Herman, who's one of the world authorities, has just published more than one book on the topic. So we'll, here goes, seven minutes. <laughs> uh, this time I will get out of my watch. Uh, first of all, I want to say that this is an extremely complicated question because to answer with a sort of flat-footed guess the New Testament gives us a reliable portrayal of Jesus oversimplifies a set of very complex questions. I think we have to ask how the Gospels are true. What is the literary genre of this text? What is the nature of the claims they are making? Do they tend simply to be reports or transcriptions of historical facts? Or are they doing something else? What I want to suggest to you is that what we have in our canonical Gospels is a set of faithful witnesses to the identity of Jesus as that identity was preserved in the early church's memory and received and interpreted in the early church's tradition. Now that may be, uh, that compact formulation may be slightly complicated, but it suggests that the identity of Jesus uh, are, and the truthfulness of the Gospels is not strictly to be identified in a one-to-one -one fashion with their historical factuality. As a matter of fact, I do not believe that our Gospels are literally inerrant in all their details as historical reports. In point of fact, what we have in each of the four Gospels is a portrait, and these portraits are drawn with a certain artistic freedom. They're drawn for theological ends. Let me give you an example of what I mean. In the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus' last meal with his disciples is portrayed as a Passover meal. This is especially clear in the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you. But if you turn to the Gospel of John and look at the chronology surrounding Jesus' death, it is clear that Jesus is sentenced and crucified on the day of preparation for the Passover. Indeed, at the hour when presumably the Passover lambs were being slaughtered. Now, people who are worried about historical factuality they say, oh, there's a contradiction. But in fact, each of the Gospels has a theological purpose in telling the story that way. So the Gospel of John is because Jesus is identified as the Lamb of God from the first chapter of the Gospel. And after the time of his crucifixion, John actually quotes the text from Exodus 12 that says, No bone shall be broken from the Passover sacrifice. So John's chronology identifies Jesus as the Passover Lamb, whereas the Synoptic Gospel, by presenting the Last Supper as a Passover meal, are making a theological claim of a different kind. Both of them relate to the death of Jesus to the Passover, but they do it in distinct ways. I could give example after example of this sort of thing. Look at the question of where Jesus' action in the temple of overturning the tables and money changers appears. The Gospel of John puts it right at the beginning of Jesus' action in John 2. The Synoptic Gospels put it at the end uh, as the climactic event that precipitates Jesus' arrest and execution. And the more one multiplies such examples, the more one sees that the way to read these texts is that they're texts that are bearing witness and offering a certain kind of theological testimony. They're testifying to a historical figure, and they are offering an account of his character and his mission, which I would assert is broadly historically reliable. But that we have to deal with these Gospels as narratives 
narratives that give us renderings of the identity of Jesus. Now, if we want to put on our hat as historians and say, can we make distinctions? Who's right? Did Jesus go into the temple and turn the tables at the beginning or the end of his ministry? Then I think there's room for such judgments. My own judgment on that, for example, would be that almost surely the synoptic chronology is right. That this is the event that happened towards the end of Jesus' life, and that John has moved it forward for theological reasons. But what can we say most certainly in terms of factuality of what the Gospels say about Jesus? Let me see if I can do this in about two minutes. Jesus was a Jew. Maybe I should put a period right there. Jesus was a Jew. That's a very important historical fact. He was a Jew who was crucified under the authority of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, as a rebel or an insurrectionist who claimed to be a new Jewish king. He proclaimed the kingdom of God, by which he meant he expected that God was about to act and was indeed acting in and through him to restore the kingdom to Israel. He had table fellowship with sinners, tax collectors, and prostitutes, with people who were lowly and rejected and scorned in his society. And that was consonant with the message he preached about a reversal of God's mercy to the poor and downcast. He performed dramatic healings, and he was a prophet who came into conflict with authorities in his own society, as exemplified by that action of turning over the tables in the temple. And finally, at what I think is at the historical core of what we can say about Jesus of Nazareth is that from the very earliest trace we have of any evidence about him, his followers proclaimed that after his crucifixion, he had been raised from the dead, vindicated by God, and that his death and resurrection were the means whereby God was reconciling the world to himself. Now you can decide whether you think that's true or not. That's a theological judgment. But the historical judgment is that from the earliest discernible level of any Christian tradition, Christians were going around saying that he had been raised from the dead. If any of these things that I just enumerated about Jesus are to be true and reliable historical testimony, then almost everything that the Gnostic Gospels would say about Jesus <laughs> Professor Ehrman now has seven minutes, and again the question is, does the New Testament give us a reliable portrayal of Jesus? I was saying over dinner that I wasn't sure we were going to disagree on very much, and uh, I'm afraid this probably end up being true. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> when discussing whether the portrayals uh, of the gospel are true, or uh, as I would put it, they're historically uh, accurate, I think it's important to understand where the gospels came from. We call them Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, but in fact, we don't know who the authors were. These uh, Gospels are all anonymous. Uh, none of the authors claims to be Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. These anonymous uh, authors were later called by these names because uh, early Christians, starting in the second century, wanted to attribute apostolic authority to these texts, to these texts that were being used in the most widely in churches, and so they had to go back to the apostles, and so they associated the names of the apostles with these texts. But there are good reasons for thinking that Jesus' own followers did not write any of these books. Uh, just to uh, simplify uh, matters here, as, as uh, Richard has also had, had to do, Jesus or the followers were lower class, illiterate, Aramaic speaking peasants of Galilee. These books were written by highly trained, literate, Greek speaking Christians of the next generation. Whoever wrote these books was not the followers of Jesus. Where then did they get their information from? Well, the Gospels are usually uh, dated to around the year 65 or 70, up to the year 95 or so. So if Jesus died in the year 30, the Gospels are separated from the life of Jesus by 35 to 65 years. These dates I'm giving you are the dates that uh, uh, 
Uh, I actually learned when I was a fundamentalist going to the Bible Institute, where Bible is our middle name. <laughs> and, there, and there probably the day that there's a deep thing in this class. I think just, I mean, you know, they're guessing, but most people guess that the Gospels are very five to 65 years after the life of Jesus. How did these authors get their stories? They weren't there to see these things happen, they weren't the silencers. They got their stories from the oral tradition. After Jesus' life, his followers told stories about him, and stories circulated by word of mouth from one person to another, year after year, decade after decade, until they came down to the authors of the Gospels. What happens when stories are put in oral circulation? They change. They change radically. As anybody knows who has a child who played the telephone game uh, in their front room uh, for a birthday party, traditions get changed when they get circulated. This isn't simply uh, a wild guess in this case. We know that the traditions about Jesus have got changed, and sometimes got changed radically, because we have lots of Gospels. And a number of these Gospels contain stories that nobody thinks happened. Well, where did these stories come from? Some Christian made them up. What about the stories in the Gospels? The stories in the Gospels also, some of them were made up, and some of them were changed. How do we know this? We know this by reading the Gospels carefully. What most people do when they read the Gospels, uh, those who do read the Gospels, is that they read Matthew, they start at the end and they go to the end. So they read it vertically from top to bottom. Then they read Mark from top to bottom, and it sure sounds a lot like Matthew. Then they read Luke, top to bottom, sounds a lot like Matthew and Mark. Then they read John, well, it's different, but it's pretty much the same kind of thing. See? So they're reading the Gospels vertically. The key to seeing that these stories got changed over time is to read the Gospels not vertically, but read them horizontally. Read a story in Matthew, then read the same story in Mark, and compare the differences. And then read the same story in Luke, or the same story in John. When you read the Gospels horizontally, you find substantial evidence that somebody's changing the stories because the stories don't agree. When did Jesus die? Was it the day before the Passover meal was eaten, or is it the day after the Passover meal was eaten? Who carried Jesus' cross? Did Jesus carry his whole, the whole way or did Simon the Cyrene carry his cross? What happened on the third day after Jesus' death? Women went to the tomb. Which women? How many were there? What were their names? What did they see there? Who did they see there? Were there a man there? Were there two men there? Was there an angel there? What were they told to do? Were they told to tell the disciples to go to Galilee, or were the disciples supposed to stay in Jerusalem? Did the women tell anybody? Mark says they told nobody at all. That's where the gospel ends. The other gospel said they went and told the disciples. Well, did the disciples go to Galilee, or did they stay in Jerusalem? It depends which gospel you read. These gospels are different up and down the line, and you can see when you read them, uh, when you read them horizontally. As a result, the Gospels do contain, obviously, some historically accurate information. The Gospels do contain some historically accurate information. The question is, how much accurate information do they contain? They also contain changes of stories, as the stories were in circulation by word of mouth. You need to realize that the people telling the stories about Jesus over the years, by and large, were not eyewitnesses, or, and were not people who even knew eyewitnesses. The way it worked was this. I'm a businessman in the city of Ephesus. I've uh, heard a preacher who's come to town to tell me about Jesus. On the basis of this storyteller's views about Jesus, I give up my pagan gods, and I begin to worship Jesus because of the stories I've heard. I tell my wife the stories. My wife converts. She goes next door and tells the neighbors. She converts. Her husband converts. And her husband goes on a business trip to Smyrna. He tells people there, and they convert. Those people in Smyrna, where did they get the stories about Jesus from? They got them from my next door neighbor. Well, where did he get from? He got from his wife. Where did she get from? She there to see me? No, she got from my wife. Where did my wife get from? She got from me. Where I get from? I heard some guy who's visiting town. This goes on for decades. The stories did change. And we have evidence that got changed because we have the Gospels that are all different from one another. The Gospels contain some historically accurate information, they contain some changes, and they contain some inventions, some stories that were made up. Richard uh, and I are probably going to disagree on an important point. Uh, Richard uh, insists that, and, and he, his basic point is that the Gospels give us faithful portrayals of Jesus. 
Now, I'm not going to say that they're unfaithful betrayers, but I am going to ask them when it's time for me to ask a question or two. <laughs> what constitutes a faithful betrayer, and how do you know? Example, you think that in Mark 1 1, the phrase, uh, the 
this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Some manuscripts lack the words the Son of God, and you believe that's a secondary addition, what you call an orthodox corruption. But do any of such any examples like that actually alter what we think the Gospels are claiming about the identity of Jesus? For example, it's quite clear that the dramatic climax of the Gospel of Mark is the centurion's confession, truly this man was the Son of God. And that, that is not textually contested. And so I mean, maybe that's a, a setup example. But my point is whether, whether your work whether your work on the text actually leads you at any point to think that what Christian theology has claimed about Jesus is not supported at all by the canonical God. Yeah, I just had this flashback to high school debate where the Marxists you would ask more questions than the other thing could possibly answer. <laughs> <laughs> and then the reputation was the ten things they hadn't been able to address. <laughs> uh, do I contest any of the historical claims that Richard made about Jesus? I think basically he and I see eye to eye on uh, much of the historical Jesus. Um, I place a heavier emphasis on Jesus being a monolithic prophet. Uh, and far less emphasis, uh, for example, on his healings. I think anybody who claims that Jesus was a healer is making a theological claim, not a historical claim, because miracles by their very nature cannot be historically demonstrated. Uh, and I'm happy to, uh, to go into that in some considerable length if you want. And for the same reason, I think, I think Richard's phrasing was important to, to recognize that the early Christians claimed that Jesus was raised from the dead. But I thought he was listing uh, uh, what he considered to be factual information about Jesus, not about the claims made about Jesus, and there's a very big difference. I'm not denying that Jesus was raised from the dead, but I am saying that's a theological affirmation that cannot be historically demonstrated, because historians can only show what happens in the natural world. By the very nature, historians cannot say what God has done. And the Christian claim about Jesus being raised is the claim that, that God has raised him from the dead. Uh, secondly, um, Richard wanted to know uh, what I made from these uh, claim by Luke and implicitly by John to be relying on eyewitness accounts. Uh, I've got two things to say about that, uh, three things to say about that. Uh, first, um, one needs to recognize that this is a common claim made by history writers in the ancient world. But in fact, this is, a, this is simply a standard literary trope that Luke follows in the, in the first four verses of Luke, uh, Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. He's simply giving a prologue which indicates that he's done his homework, which is what historians always do when they begin their work, whether they've done any homework or not. So I don't think the claim itself actually shows that Luke uh, conducted uh, interviews with eyewitnesses or anything of the sort. The claim actually has to be tested, and this is my second point. The claim has to be tested about whether an author uh, appears to have uh, had uh, any access to eyewitness reports. Of course, the eyewitnesses to Jesus' life were lower-class peasants in Galilee who were speaking Aramaic. Uh, there's no indication that Luke knew Aramaic or that he'd spend any time in Palestine, or that he knew any of these eyewitnesses. Uh, I don't know who Luke was. I seem to call him Luke because it doesn't make sense to call him Fred. Uh, but um, uh, whoever he was, uh, I don't think he actually gives any evidence of having interviewed any eyewitnesses. We know one of, uh, we know one of Luke's sources. And so the best way to see whether Luke is trying to preserve accurately the things he had heard is to compare him with what his source says. And uh, I am I am 98 percent sure that in his New Testament class, Richard teaches that Luke used as one of the sources the Gospel of Mark. Yes, I did. Make that 99 percent sure. <laughs> <laughs> historians always have to hedge. You might be lying. So historians have to hedge. <laughs> I could ask my witnesses. <laughs> Gospel of Mark, and so it makes for a very interesting 
comparison to see what Luke does in the Gospel of Mark. And in fact, uh, you know, Luke says that he, he has many predecessors, and now he wants to give the story straight. He wants to give the correct version. He wants to tell, tell it correctly, which might be an implicit um, castigation of his predecessors, but it was Mark. Which is uh, which uh, possible? So, uh, what about Luke and Mark? Well, we can go into a lot of details because Luke actually changes Mark in a lot of places, leading to contradiction. But I don't want to deal with the contradiction here. What I want to do with is, a, is an overall portrayal of Jesus going to his death in Mark and in Luke, because uh, this gets to the point I'm going to raise later about faithful witnesses. In Mark's gospel, we have a very gripping and telling portrayal of Jesus going to his death. Jesus is uh, betrayed by one of his followers. He's denied three times by another one. All the other followers flee. Jesus is put on trial before Pontius Pilate. And uh, at his trial, he says two and only two words in Greek. Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replies, sum legates. You say so. That's it. Jesus doesn't say anything throughout the entire proceeding afterwards. He goes to his crucifixion, he's silent on the way. He's nailed to the cross, he's silent while being nailed. He's on the cross, he's silent while, being, uh, while hanging on the cross. He doesn't say anything. Everybody else says things, though. Everybody else mocks him. The, uh, the leaders of the Jews mock him, those passing by mock him. The, uh, both other robbers mock him on the cross, and at the end, Jesus says his only words. He cries out at the end in Mark's gospel, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he dies. Jesus appears to feel forsaken, not only by his followers and his leaders and everyone else, but by God himself. What about Luke's portrayal of Jesus going to his death? In Luke's Gospel, Jesus is not silent. On the way to crucifixion, he sees women weeping by the side of the road, and he turns to them and he says, Don't weep for me, daughters of Jerusalem. Weep for yourselves and for your children for the faith that's to be called you. He's more concerned about these women's faith than his own faith. While being nailed to the cross in Luke's Gospel, Jesus isn't silent. Instead, he prays, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. While hanging on the cross in Luke's gospel, Jesus has an intelligent conversation with one of the robbers. One of the robbers mocks Jesus, and the other one tells him to be quiet, because Jesus hasn't done anything to deserve this. He then turns to Jesus and says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus knows exactly what's happening to him, and he knows why it's happening to him, and he knows what's going to happen to him after it happens to him. He's going to wake up in paradise, and this guy's going to be next to him. Does Jesus feel forsaken of God in this gospel? At the very end, instead of crying out, my like, God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus says, Father, into your hands I command my spirit. And he dies. This is a very different portrayal of Jesus. Now, what people do, of course, is they take Mark's portrayal, and they take Luke's portrayal, and they smash them together. And then they throw in Matthew, and they throw in John for good measure, and they give the seven last words of the dying Jesus, which is found, are found in precisely none of the Gospels. <laughs> and so when people do that, what they do, in fact, is they create their own Gospel, one that is unlike any of those in the New Testament. Is Luke historically accurate? Well, no. Uh, he's probably not. Mark probably isn't. They have some historical accurate material and some inaccurate material. But their portraits of Jesus are very different from one another. Uh, finally, I think I'm probably out of time. Has the New Testament been corrupted? Uh, yes, the New Testament has been changed. Uh, does, you know, any, you know, we don't have the original New Testament. We simply have copies that were made centuries, in most cases centuries later. And these copies all have differences from one another. Uh, and so uh, there are places where scholars debate what the original text of the New Testament actually said. There are some places where we don't know what it said. Do any of these places matter? Well, it depends on whether the text matters. Does it matter what Mark wanted to say? If it matters what he said, then you have to know his words. And if you change his words, you change his meaning. So yes, it matters. If we don't know the text of Luke 3, 23, or 22, 19 through 20, or 23, 37, et cetera, et cetera. We don't know what the text said, then how can we say what this author was trying to convey? 
and you can multiply examples all night long of places where it actually matters what these authors said, so that reconstructing their actual words ends up making a big difference to people who want to interpret the New Testament.
there taking what Jesus had said at the moment. No, of course not. It can't be both things. If you were trying to establish in a court of law and call witnesses, you would have to decide which of these you think is the more accurate account. But each of them, I would submit to you, represents a facet of the significance of Jesus' death, which truly gives us an account of his identity. For Mark, the account of Jesus dying in this state of abandonment and suffering, such that the cross becomes the ultimate disclosure of the death of God's love in Christ, of being willing to go even to that point is a true claim, a theologically true claim, I would say, about Jesus' death. Whereas Luke's claim that Jesus goes to his death as the obedient servant who willingly gives up his life is also a true claim about Jesus' death. And the theological and literary idiot in which these authors are writing is making that claim by placing the, the account of the death of Jesus in conjunction with different scriptural texts. So do I want to say Mark is right and Luke is wrong? No, I don't want to say that. And furthermore, I don't, I also, and this is a place where we agree, I don't want to do the harmony of crunching them together so that we get the seven last words of Jesus. There was an author in the early church who did that. His name was Patian. He produced uh, a compilation, a harmony of the Gospels called the Dia Tessima, which took all four Gospels, put them in the blender, pushed the button, and gave us one story. This Gospel, this Dia Tessima, was very widely used in the early Syrian church, but ultimately the emergent uh, proto orthodoxy, to use Bart's term, ended up rejecting the Dia Tessima and said, no, it's important that we have a fourfold Gospel. Not just one gospel that we're going to say is historically factual and therefore reliable, but we need all four of these quite different accounts of Jesus in order to give us a more rounded picture of who he was and what the significance of his life and death really was. So when I, when I use the term faithful, that's the sense in which I'm using it. Faithful to what? Faithful to the true identity of Jesus Christ faithful to the true identity of Jesus Christ. And that is certainly not just a historical claim. It's definitely a theological claim. I'm going to hold my comments in response to the question about non-canonical texts uh, for a few moments longer, because that's the subject of our second round of questions, and I think I don't have time really to speak to that at the moment. Why, why, but let me say, why these four? Why the, why the canonical documents are reliable? Chiefly because they are the earliest witnesses we have. They are written a century earlier than any of these other non-canonical documents, a century or more earlier than these other non-canonical documents. And I, I still believe that one of my teachers, Nils Dahl, a great uh, uh, Scandinavian and gentleman scholar, Father Gale, wrote on this question, he said, if we believe that the authors of the canonical Gospels falsified or misunderstood their master when they were writing these texts, then we literally know nothing about him and we are free to give fantasy free reign. And that, in fact, is what has happened in a lot of contemporary scholarship fantasy has been given free reign. The reason that I accept these accounts is because I believe they are both the earliest extant accounts of Jesus' identity and they are also the accounts which were received broadly from the tradition as offering reliable and truthful accounts of who he was. And I think the early church was smart enough. They, they weren't dumb. They didn't really they, they were as aware as we are that there were tensions and even contradictions between these accounts. But they thought that all of these different accounts were necessary in order to bear witness to the complexity of the reality of the events of the Jesus Christ.
end of our time together and ask you that last question that we had talked about and leave out the last segment where the two of you go back and forth and then leave some time, 20, 25, maybe 30 minutes uh, at the end for all of you to ask, uh, ask these first questions. So maybe we can try to answer this one in five minutes or these are close to five minutes. Um, and the question, the question is this that Richard hit on there at the end. The question is, do other ancient writings outside of canonical New Testament provide reliable portrayals of Jesus? Dr. Irwin, will you read this one? outside the New Testament do make claims to be written by apostles. We have uh, first-hand narratives of Jesus' life from Peter and from Philip and from Thomas. Uh, and now, uh, as you know, from several, a couple of weeks ago, now from uh, Judas Iscariot. I actually agree with Richard that these Gospels are not uh, as historically accurate as those of the New Testament. I agree uh, that they are later. Uh, I do not agree that they are a century or more later. Uh, the Gospel of John was written around the year uh, 90 or so. Uh, Papyrus Egerton II was certainly written around the year 120. Uh, the Gospel of Thomas must have been written around the year 120. The Gospel of Peter was probably written around the year 120. So we're talking about uh, Gospels that are about 30 years removed uh, from the latest uh, New Testament Gospel. The thing about these other Gospels is that they are late and they are legendary. But it would be a mistake to assume that the New Testament Gospels, since they're early, therefore they're accurate, and after all, they are in the New Testament, whereas non-canonical Gospels are late and legendary, and so we don't need to pay any attention to them. I think that that's a serious mistake. Because these other Gospels also have points of view. The writers were also Christians who also believed that they had true insights into who Jesus was, and their insights are worth listening to today. Probably the most striking discovery of modern studies of early Christianity is that early Christianity was remarkably diverse. Christians in the second and third centuries believed things that today you would label as completely out of, out of range of anything Christian. But they believed these things, and they called themselves Christians, and they said they had, uh, that they were followers of Jesus, and they had writings to prove it. Church authors had to decide which books were going to be included in the canon of Scripture. They had a variety of ways of deciding this. Why is it that the Gospel of Peter is not in the New Testament? Because church fathers decided that Peter didn't write it. How did we know that Peter didn't write it? Because it contained a theology that was questionable. And if the theology is questionable, it can't go back to Peter. But what makes the theology questionable? Is that the theology doesn't agree with me. It's a docetic Christology. And docetic Christologies are false. And therefore, Peter couldn't have written it. See, that's the early church logic. If it's heretical, it can't have been written by an apostle. People who accept that judgment today, uh, and, and I happen to agree, Peter did not write the gospel of Peter for, for historical reasons, but one needs to realize that the canon itself is shaped on theological grounds. These are the books that the majority of Christians who eventually won the battles of the what to believe decided would be included in Scripture. They decided this for all time, so today when you go to the bookstore, you don't have an option about what's going to be in your New Testament. It's going to be the same 27 books every time. 
But by canonizing the New Testament, the church fathers did two very important clever things. They excluded a number of viewpoints, which at the time were vying for a position in the churches. They excluded some viewpoints, and they managed to bring the viewpoints of the canon together in such a way as to tame them, tame them. So then Matthew, who thinks that Christians are to follow the law, is put into the same canon as Paul, who says that following the law is not going to bring about salvation. You put them in the same hard cover, so to speak, and you interpret each of them against the other, thereby softening the edges of both. Mark has a portrayal of Jesus in which Jesus is not understood to be God. John has an understanding of Jesus in which Jesus is understood to be God. You put them in the same canon and read them against one another and you create your theology. They both excluded some viewpoints and they tamed other viewpoints. Uh, that's what the canon did. Let me conclude with, uh, with the question I'm not supposed to have time to ask. Which is this. <laughs> if the main value of the New Testament Gospels is that they are our earliest surviving gospel witnesses, and that's yeah. what makes them theologically the most important, what are we going to do when the next gospel that gets discovered isn't the Gospel of Judas written in the year 140, but is one of the gospels that Luke used in making his gospel, and it differs significantly from the, the, from the views of the New Testament Gospels? If you say earliest is most valid, I think it's going to open you up to major theological problems down the road. Salvation, therefore, consists in escaping from this evil, corrupted, material reality. And number three, the way one escapes from that reality is through the communication of a special secret knowledge. This secret knowledge is available only to a tiny number of elite, enlightened persons who have the spark of divine truth within them. And the great majority 
of other people, including other Christians, who are simply pitiable fools. The Gospel of Judas opens with a scene in which Jesus is portrayed as laughing contemptuously at his other disciples other than Judas because they are celebrating the Eucharist and worshiping what he calls their God, that is, the Jewish God. And that leads to my last point that these Gospels are profoundly anti-Jewish. They are profoundly rejection, that they entail a profound rejection of Israel, Israel scripture, and everything that the Jewish people had traditionally believed about God. Those are the kinds of reasons why these Gospels were rejected in the early church. And I believe that those reasons still constitute very good grounds for us to reject them today as being of any spiritual value for the church. Now it is not the case that every extra canonical gospel manifests all the features I've just described. There are certainly some texts that have softer versions, and not all of these extra canonical gospels are Gnostic, but many of them are the ones that have been discovered as non Gnostic and so on. My point is this, that the triumph of proto-orthodoxy in the church was the triumph of a movement that was defending the Old Testament as scripture, the church's continuity with Israel, defending the claim that the God and Father of Jesus Christ is the same God who is the creator of the world, and that God's intent is to redeem the world, not to help us escape from it. And finally, they were defending an inclusive Catholic view of salvation, that all who become followers of Jesus can be saved, not merely the specialized elite who enjoy uh, a carefully guarded set of mysterious knowledge. And so the proto-Orthodox Church, I think, was defending matters that I myself would want to defend on grounds that are deeply theological. One other comment I would make about this is that the orthodox position was held by people who were themselves, during the second and third century, beginning to undergo serious persecution at the hands of government authorities, not always systematic, but in, in many places this was starting to happen. And the representatives of the Nazi movement, by and large, escaped such persecution because they, according to Irenaeus, other early church fathers were willing simply to say whatever they needed to say uh, to avoid being persecuted. Now, you may say that's a slander, but I think there's some truth in it. The people who were suffering and being having their heads cut off and being thrown to the lions and so on were not reading the Gospel of Judas and the Gospel of Thomas. They were reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The proto-Orthodox position won out because it was faithful to the earliest apostolic testimony and because it bore witness above all to the fact that the world is created by a God who loves us. That's why it won out. Now, my final singer question for Professor <laughs> is this. I, I, I'm, this is a genuine question. I've actually been wanting to ask you this for some time, Bart. I actually agree with you that Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet. I didn't highlight that very prominently in my historical summary, but I, I agree that Jesus was an apocalyptic, uh, a Jewish apocalyptic prophet. And one of the uh, characteristics, it seems to me, that's most salient about texts like the Gospel of Judas and other early Gnostic Gospels is the radical rejection of the Jewish apocalyptic framework for interpreting Jesus' mission and identity. And so I find it hard to understand how you put together your historical analysis of Jesus as an apocalyptic prophet with your enthusiasm for the last day of God. That's why I hear the comment. <laughs> So if you all ask questions and they answer the questions that they pose to one another, don't be offended. <laughs> <laughs> we 
we are going to move into a uh, time of question and answer from you all. It's a little after 8.15. If you need to leave, feel free to leave. You know, free up seats for those who would like to see. Um, <laughs> since we got started late, I do want to try to take us towards 8.45. Since we got started about 15 minutes late, if these two gentlemen would be okay with it to go until about 8.45 which gives us close to 30 minutes of question and answer. The way we'll do this is, um, I'll take a question, we can pose it to one or both of them. You'll have to speak loudly because we don't have microphones, we're microphones the way we want them to have, so you'll have to speak loudly and clearly so everybody uh, can hear you, and I'll try to facilitate your questions. If somebody have a question to pose to one of our questions? Sir. Please, please stand up and speak loudly. The idea that Jesus was running around Mary Magdalene is not based on anything in the New Testament or in any of the other Gospels, because in the New Testament she's mentioned only once in this association with Jesus. Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, we learn that Joanna, Susanna, and Mary Magdalene accompanied Jesus, along with a large number of other women, accompanied Jesus and his disciples on their travels, and they provided them with funds they needed to survive. We're also told in this passage that seven demons had gone out of Mary Magdalene, who were not told that Jesus is the one who did the exorcism. That's the only reference to Mary Magdalene during Jesus' entire public ministry in the Gospels. Uh, the other twelve references are uh, references to, to her watching Jesus get crucified, seeing where he got buried, and going to the tomb on the third morning with other women. In all, all these cases, she's with other women. So she's not singled out as somebody who's particularly close or special to Jesus in the New Testament. However, in some of these traditions about going to the tomb on the third morning, some of the traditions indicate that Mary Magdalene herself was the first one to see that Jesus' tomb was empty, and the first to proclaim that he had been raised from the dead. If that's true, historically, then you can make the argument that Mary Magdalene started Christianity. 
And if Christianity is the belief that Jesus was raised from the dead, and Mary Magdalene is the person either to recognize or at least to proclaim it, she's the one that started Christianity. Now, it's not the same thing, though, as saying she started Christianity, it's saying when she, uh, you know, that they had sex and she had his babies. So, <laughs> <laughs> the Minji girl wants to play, they're slightly different kind of levels of <laughs> But as for what we know about her, uh, both, it's multiple attested that she, she and other women accompanied Jesus on some of their travels, and that's about all. And could she have been married to him, even though no other source mentions it? It's possible she was married to him. It's possible he was married to Mary of Bethany, or to Martha, or to Salome, or to Joanna, or to Susanna, or to Peter. <laughs> By the way, if she was married to Jesus, there is a, there is a problem with saying she's married to Jesus. Maybe how she identified as Mary Magdalene. Magdalene comes from, means Mary of Magdala. Magdala was a fishing village on the Sea of Galilee in, in, in Galilee. So she's not Mary of Bethany. She can't be the same Mary of Mary of Mark, but Mary of Bethany comes from Bethany, which is in Judea. She comes from Magdala, which is in, in Galilee, two different women. Now, why, why Mary of Bethany, why Mary Magdalene? Why are these Marys called by Jesus? Right? Because people don't have last names in the ancient world. Like, I mean, Temple Hill, I have to tell my undergraduates this, that Jesus Christ, Christ is not his last name. <laughs> this is not Jesus Christ born to Joseph and Mary Christ. <laughs> so when people have common names, you have to identify them with some other features because they don't have last names. So Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary from Bethany, Mary from Abdallah. But for picking a distinctive feature that distinguishes this Mary from other Marys, and she were she happened to be the spouse of the Savior of the world, <laughs> couldn't you think of something to distinguish her other than the fact she came from Abdallah? <laughs> That's a problem, but probably even in the earliest traditions, they had, they had no, no love for her. Supper. 
Uh, I don't want to put a great deal of weight on that argument. Uh, I do think that in, in oral culture traditions do undergo transformation as they are circulated. And so uh, I, I don't disagree with that. One of the, the curiosities about our canonical gospels, particularly the three synoptic gospels, is that there are passages where they have almost dead on verbatim agreement among the three. Other passages where they don't. But where they do, what does that indicate? Does it indicate that Matthew and Luke are both copying Mark, which I think is a likely explanation? Uh, or some, some others have suggested that uh, this is to be understood simply in terms of oral transmission of the tradition. Um, but I, I, think that, I think that arguably the sort of apologetic argument that the Gospels are historically factual because oral tradition then was more reliable than it is now uh, is, does not seem to me to be a very strong argument. Comment about this too, but because Richard brought up the, uh, the uh, second century church father Tatian, who wrote the Via Tessera, who brought the four gospels together into one big mega gospel, which reconciles the differences that you find in the world tradition. You know, it's not, not just an ancient phenomenon. When I was in, at college at the Moody Bible Institute, uh, we, uh, I, I had purchased a, a book called The Life of Christ in Stereo. <laughs> and uh, this, this guy had exactly the same idea. He would take the gospels and kind of smash them together so you could get the full picture. And it's like some very interesting results. You know, in Mark's gospel, we're told that Jesus tells Peter that before the cock crows twice, he'll deny him three times. In Matthew's gospel, uh, Jesus said, before the cock crows, he'll deny him three times. Well, which is it? Before the cock crows, or before the cock crows twice? Well, in the life of Christ in stereo, there's a very simple solution. Peter denied him six times. <laughs> three times before the cock crows, three times before it crows twice. So, uh, so yes, if you want to reconcile any of these differences, you can do so. Over this side, uh, speak loudly, please. Persuasion and the overwhelming 
a book of Catholic tradition called Census Fidelium, the kind of consensus within the emerging church that this, these texts were true and these weren't. And it's only after Christianity becomes the religion of empire that you start to get convergent at the point of the swords and so on. And I think the fact is a tragedy, a theological tragedy of unspeakable proportions. And it is that truth that Brown in the Dimension Code taps into the notion that the institutional church did in various ways in its later history become a coercive institution. And I lament that deeply and as speaking as a theologian, it seems to me that cure for that is the recovery of the canonical, the true canonical witness. It's not the uh, attempt to recover these uh, Gnostic Gospels. But that, that would be my prescription for the theological disease. <laughs> One, we think of uh, uh, other uh, scholars who uh, support the idea of harmonization. We don't like them. <laughs> But they're dealing with this problem of human alienation, and I think about this seriously. 
rather than simply castigated as being a radical and outside the canon, because I think all the voices are early Christians who go to be heard. I think that the people who make these arguments for harmonizing all the gospel accounts do so because they're operating out of a quite serious religious motivation, an attempt to respect the authority of the Bible. That's, that's the underlying motivation. But it's coupled with a certain fear that if one can find one sentence in the Bible that isn't true, that's the pinprick that's going to let all the air go out of the world. You see what I mean? There's a kind of fearfulness there that I think is very different from the spirit in which the early church understood what scripture was about. And I, I think part of what I want to say when I encounter people like this, uh, the two of us were actually on a panel over at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary about three months ago. And if you encounter the people, take that view. In fact, we quite aggressively take that view. <laughs> and uh, it, 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 it's, it, it's too condescending to say, but what I want to say in particular is this very angry guy who is pounding his fist on the table and insisting there are no contradictions with the gospel. I want to say to him this, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be so afraid. The truth will vindicate itself. The truth of the word will vindicate itself if you read the gospel in just the way Mark was just saying. Read them attentively and respectfully with a view to seeing their difference in the individuality of their witnesses. <laughs> Those of us in Durham have not quite felt right in the world since about the sweet 16. Thanks for your response on that. Right here. Since the past can never be repeated, it's always a probability judgment. It's not like the empirical sciences where you can, you can go through the experiment time after time and time and get the same results. In history, there's no experiment to be repeated because once it's over, it's over and done with. So you have to have other kinds of evidence in order to demonstrate what probably happened in the past. Some things are certain in the past. Uh, um, it is, it is relatively certain, for example, that in 2004, it was UNC that won the national championship. <laughs> it's right through here on this campus, and that, in fact, is relatively certain. Uh, there are other things that are less certain. If we are back to go into history, of course, the heart of Harvard and Gibbs. I mean, uh, we don't know most about what happened in the ancient past because we simply don't have sources. Now, historians by the very nature can only establish what probably happened. What are miracles? Well, miracles defy probability. Otherwise, they wouldn't be miracles. 
Uh, to put it in simple terms, if, uh, if, if all of us try to walk across lukewarm water, and by the way, this latest news came about Jesus walking on ice. So, the reality is, uh, none of us can do it. We would all sink, and that'd be true of all the millions of people in the world. What's the probability that somebody can do it? Well, it's less than one in six billion, so I don't know what the probability is, but it'd be very improbable. Now, um, suppose you have somebody, suppose you have a story saying that somebody did it. Well, the story can only establish what probably happened, because that's, that's what we're limited by. The historian cannot say that a miracle probably happened, because miracles defy probability. It's simply a definitional problem. So I'm not saying that Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, it would be crazy to think that he was raised from the dead. I'm saying that if you think that, that's a faith claim. It is not a historical judgment, because historians can never demonstrate that a miracle happened. It's simply the limitations of our historical evidence. There's nothing we can do about that. It doesn't matter whether you like it or not. It doesn't matter whether you're a Christian, or you're an agnostic, or if you're a Jew, or if you're a Muslim, or if you're a Buddhist, or anything else. It simply doesn't matter. Historians can only establish probabilities, and miracles by the definition are the least probable event that ever happened. So. <laughs>
ask a question. Uh, one last question. Maybe uh, our guests will stay around for a couple of minutes afterwards. But one last question. Right here. Thank you so much. 